Good morning, and thanks for coming back early. My name's Joel Miner, and I'm a second year here at Stanford Law School and also in the um, in Emmett program in Environment and Resources. And it is my absolute pleasure to get to introduce our second keynote speaker today, um, which is Christina M. Jurdy. She is the Senior High Seas Advisor to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and General Ocean Celebrity. She is a graduate of NYU Law School, and she knows She's an expert in just about everything in the international law of the high seas. So after beginning her career with a, a private firm specializing in uh, admiralty law, which is an uh, exciting and unique field, which I don't, don't think we even have to study here at Stanford, she um, expanded into more of an advisory and research role with lots of incredible opportunities through things like the Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation. And uh, she wanted me to say she's worked for just about everyone in this room in, in some capacity. So in addition to her work as in the advisory roles for various organizations that are probably too many to list here, she has founded, or co rather co-founded, and continues to serve on the board of the Global Ocean Biodiversity Initiative, the Saragasso Sea Alliance, and the High Seas Alliance. And she's also currently serving as an adjunct faculty at the Monterey Institute for International Studies. And that leads to an, an anecdote I, I heard earlier I wanted to share, which is I was talking to someone and, and said I got to introduce her. And they said, you know, I, I had her at, at Monterey. And it was actually really horrible. She was my first professor. And after that, it just nothing, nothing could compare. So, <laughs> and with that, Christina Jody. Well, thank you very much. It is indeed a pleasure to be here. And um, I think you all are a very tough act to follow. That's what I heard yesterday was absolutely amazing. And you'll see from the opening slide why I like to work with scientists. We get hold of nifty graphics. Uh, <laughs> that uh, unlike the law meetings that I go to at the United Nations, we actually get to deal with things that move and adapt and progress. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do the same in the legal regime that we're trying to cope with today. Because we truly do have some challenges of managing this ever-changing ocean. But we have the advantage of knowing so much more than we did 10 years ago. We know from the scientists at NOAA that sea turtles follow this temperature band across the Pacific, and they're actually able to start predicting where you're more likely to find a sea turtle or not. That's been able to be used, at least with the United States, to um, inform fishers who wish to avoid of exceeding their quota on sea turtle bycatch. So what I'm going to try to do today is take you on a little personal journey through where I've been and where we're all going with respect to conservation and management of 50% of this planet, the oceans beyond national jurisdiction. As a little girl, probably like most of you, I loved playing in the waves. I loved being in and above and kissed by the waves, as my mother would say when I went tumbling in and under the waves at Stinson Beach. Um, but I also loved space, outer space and space law, and indeed studied the law of outer space when I was in law school. Because the field was a little bit slower than I had hoped it would be, I went into shipping law instead and helped to uh, advise ship owners and charterers on how to basically more effectively have their ships arrested. Uh, that's in order to get the most money from them in their liens. Uh, so it wasn't too surprising that when I went scuba diving for the first time, I was entranced that uh, my husband-to-be took us to Palau, where we were just going to go snorkeling, skim the surface, but the water was too rough to stay on top, so we had to take the plunge deep. And I haven't stopped since. That I absolutely fell in love, and I've tried to find new ways to use my legal background as a tool for enhancing the conservation of tropical coral reef ecosystems. That's working with David Freestone over there. We were able to get a new regime in the Caribbean that actually looked at the interactions of seagrasses, mangroves, and coral reefs as an ecosystem unit and how to advance the cooperation in the Caribbean as part of a specially protected areas and wildlife protocol under a regional seas agreement. That's the next stop was working at the International Maritime Organization trying to stop the impact of anchors on tropical coral reefs. And then I discovered at a workshop I was invited to, because of my shipping knowledge, that there were coral reefs as beautiful as this in the deep, dark waters of the Norwegian seas, where half of me is from, uh, Norwegian. 
uh, that, um, that corals can grow without light from the sun, that they can grow in frigid uh, waters of the Arctic and the Antarctic. But they were also being decimated by bottom trawling, uh, both within and beyond national jurisdiction. But because of the nature of the little fish they were catching that could live to be 150 years old, that they were targeting in spawning aggregations, we knew that the fishing would go from seamount to seamount, coral reef to coral reef, and soon would cover the entire high seas, where there were few laws and regulations in place to protect them. So for the last 10 years, I've basically been focusing on the high seas and the seabed area beyond national jurisdiction, which does indeed cover 45 to 50% of the planet, 64% of the ocean. Now, so what I'm gonna walk you through today is just in terms of looking at some of the challenges of managing this vast ocean mass, um, but also some of the opportunities that have come around on their own, but also opportunities that we as scientists, lawyers, and conservation organizations have been able to create. And then look at some of the progress that we have seen on the water, which of course gives me optimism, a sense of hope for what we can do in terms of pulling the pieces together in the future. That's part of our challenges is that we've always perceived the oceans as invulnerable, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this paradigm, but it actually started back, as uh, Nicholas Robinson told us yesterday, with this guy Hugo Grotius in 1609, 400 years ago. It was in, uh, developed in order to defend the rights of small countries to sail the ocean blue to get access to trading ports in the East Indies. That's, but the notion and the paradigm it set up in terms of the oceans being impervious to harm, we can take out as much as we want, we can put in as much as we want, have persisted to this date and create a true challenge in terms of trying to get a handle on what is happening in our oceans. We now have new problems and new challenges with respect to the accumulative pressures of what we have done to the oceans already, from persistent organic pollutants, from what we paint on the bottoms of our ships that last for a very long time, but of course, uh, climate change and ocean acidification, which are now causing real problems we've seen already in the water, and it will only get worse. That's we do have a legal framework that is very handy, of course. It has lots of strengths, which I'd just like to highlight, that it does clearly define the rights and duties of states, including the rights to sail the ocean blue um, and to fish. But it also put in some defined obligations with respect to conserving li living marine resources, as well as protecting and preserving the marine environment. That's it also covered for the first time all sources of marine pollution. It was attempting to be comprehensive, covering pollution from air, from ships, from land, uh, as well as what we would dump from our uh, land into the sea. It has requirements for assessing before activities take place, what potential impacts may be, and also to monitor what their impacts are. And of course, it imposed a clear duty to cooperate. But what we have seen in practice, in terms of how it's fit for um, adapting to the challenges of the 21st century, is that there are few incentives for compliance. It relies primarily on flag states to regulate themselves. There's no mention of the word marine biological diversity, no concept for understanding how you protect ecosystems, uh, no provisions for marine protected areas, despite the strong obligation to preserve the habitat of uh, rare and fragile ecosystem uh, environments. Um, and there's no, of course, rules for precaution. That's, as we've seen, is an absolutely essential component of modern day governance. And of course, there's no global rules for environmental impact assessments, although of course there are for particular sectoral activities, such as um, now deep sea bottom fishing, but dumping of waste from sea, as well as, um, what was I gonna say? Um, Oh, ocean fertilization was something that we managed to get through recently. Uh, that's, and of course, no procedure or body that's capable of looking at the full spectrum of activities that may result in cumulative activities um, on the water. But again, being an optimist, we do have some incredible opportunities going forward. That's because we do have a suite of commitments that have attempted to update the framework of the Law of the Sea Convention, but in a non-legally non binding form. That's at Rio, the first Earth Summit in 1992. Governments recognized the need for 
uh, anticipatory, precautionary, and integrated approaches to um, conservation of marine ecosystems. This was followed in 2002 by the World Summit on Sustainable Development, where governments committed to developing networks of marine protected areas, representative ones, by 2012, and ecosystem approaches by 2010. Um, of course, as you can see, all these dates have passed, so the commitments, as they are not legally binding, um, they're not 100% airtight, but they have galvanized significant action on the water that we'll be getting to in a few minutes. Um, and then, of course, most recently at Rio Plus 20, which is 20 years after the 1992 Rio um, Summit, uh, governments, oceans were very much on the agenda. Governments were grappling with whether to agree to launch a new uh, negotiation for a new treaty for high seas biodiversity. But in the end, the staunch opposition of countries like the United States, Russia, and Venezuela prevented us from coming to a consensus. Um, and they agreed to put off a decision for another year and a half. So we have until the end of 2014 to actually galvanize political commitment and opportunities, uh, as well as scientific knowledge to how to formulate a new legal regime. That's, uh, but some of us have been working on this for a very long time. Um, I first came across this paper a bit later than 2000, but how many of you have seen this paper before by David, uh, here in, David Hirenbach? Okay, excellent. All right, this was a real inspiration to me when I found it because he started talking about ocean basin wide conservation, uh, ocean basin wide marine protected areas. In fact, looking at this current that encircles uh, the vast Pacific Ocean and trying to see how we can ens enhance conservation across scale. Um, and then some of us, Larry Crowder uh, included, were also involved with uh, a book as well as a chapter on place-based conservation in the middle of a very dynamic ocean, trying to develop some of the concepts and tools that would be needed to establish protected areas and other area-based uh, measures on the high seas and in the open ocean in general. That's more um, coming up to date. We worked with um, other scientists, many of them are in the room, uh, Eddie Game, uh, Alistair Hobday, uh, even um, Possingham, whom I've never met before, but I'm pleased was here yesterday at least, I'll see you someplace, um, but trying again to look at the role of pelagic conservation. How do you uh, take measures to conserve what continuously moves under your feet and under your nose? That's, and then of course the census of marine life has given us new treasures, new core of information and knowledge uh, about places and about species that move both across vast ocean basins, but then surprisingly some that show amazing site fidelity uh, to specific places, even though we thought they were vast ocean roamers. So trying to take advantage of this new information and these new um, sort of ecological opportunities, some of us started to work through the Convention on Biological Diversity, and in 2004, 2006, six, we started to call for significant measures to protect deep sea corals, and also trying to launch cooperation towards a global network of marine protected areas that would span areas beyond national jurisdiction. And of course, you can see by the mandate of Convention on Biological Diversity includes conservation, but it is essentially restricted to the components of biodiversity within areas of national jurisdiction. But at the same time, it calls for cooperation amongst states, amongst organizations in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And so this is where we penned our um, flag, if you will, in order to create criteria for identifying areas of ecological or biological significance in the open ocean or deep sea in need of protection. These were essentially your bog standard criteria for marine protected areas, but we help to define guidelines on how you apply these in the context of the open ocean and the deep sea. We also develop uh, guidance for the design of representative networks of marine protected areas. And of course, these don't result in much um, on the water, they don't tell the governments to do anything, but they can certainly encourage them to act. And what we did was to encourage them to act was actually try to feed them the information they needed to apply these criteria in areas beyond national <laughs> jurisdiction. So with the blessing of the Census of Marine Life Scientific Steering Committee, with Duke University, Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab, Daniel Dunn and Pat Halpin, 
uh, Jeff Ardrin, who's over here, uh, who was at Marine Conservation Biology Institute at the time. We established the Global Ocean Biodiversity Initiative, a partnership really of scientists with a little bit of um, policy advice from me to try to develop illustrations on how you can apply these criteria into the open ocean. And what we developed was using information developed by Otto Lynn Harrison uh, right here uh, in Santa Cruz with respect to the, the core habitat usage patterns for species such as the elephant seal. As we saw, let's see if I can deal with this high tech area, is that uh, even though they may spend a lot of time on the coast, the females actually spend 70 to 80% of their time in the high seas in very restricted areas. Working with biological oceanographers, we're also able to identify areas of higher productivity, and then working with cetacean biologists discover that that provided an ideal habitat for blue whales to spend year-round feeding and breeding. Uh, that's it's one of the few areas where they're capable of doing both in one site. So in terms of how do you apply the scientific information into real advances on the water, um, I'll just start with deep sea first, um, which was going through scientists who, as I said, first alerted us to the problem of the impacts of bottom trawls on the deep sea habitat, but then working through the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Again, it was 70 conservation organizations and scientists pulling together to demonstrate the significant harm that was occurring to the global commons. Uh, what we resulted with was a United Nations General Assembly resolution already in 2006 that called for states and regional fisheries management organizations to prevent significant adverse impacts to deep sea ecosystems and to ensure sustainable fisheries. And of course, they reiterated the mandate from the UN Fish Stocks Agreement, which applies to straddling and highly migratory species and not our discrete high seas fish stocks, which is another hole in international law, that their duty is to prevent significant adverse impacts and to protect marine biodiversity as a whole through what they're doing. What was significant about this is that they were able to um, define and implement the concept of no significant harm in the process of fishing through prior impact assessments, so you know where you're going to be fishing, what is out there, and you're supposed to be adopting management measures to prevent these significant adverse impacts. What it resulted in was a series of precautionary closures in vast areas of the ocean, in the Southern Ocean, the Northeast Atlantic, the Northwest Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean uh, and beyond. So we do have a series of closed areas. Uh, of course, there's still problems in implementation. They haven't gotten things uh, totally correct, but what it has done is really shifted the paradigm of high seas fishing to saying you should know what you're doing prior to um, going fishing and that you should be adopting requirements that will prevent significant harm to the species and ecosystems around you. Okay, um, and then moving further south, uh, in the context of the Southern Ocean, we established the High Seas Marine Protected Areas through the IUCN uh, World Commission on Protected Areas uh, that Julia Townsend was talking about yesterday. And um, through experts in the Southern Ocean, we started the design process for a system of marine protected area in the Southern Ocean, which resulted in the first High Seas Marine Protected Area um, south of the South Orkneys um, Islands uh, that was adopted in 2009, and they're now under uh, preparation for, as we heard from uh, John Weller last night, is they've developed a measure, conservation measure, for rolling out a representative comprehensive system of marine protected areas by 2012. Well, we're a little bit beyond that yet, and we're hoping, and uh, a lot of hope is hinging on the outcome of this meeting in Germany in July of 2013. But if the gods are with us, we'll be able to have the first time that um, governments have agreed to, uh, well, to place fishing and conservation side by side as opposed to always pushing fishing first. So we're hoping to stay tuned as to what's going on. But we also have the example of what was going on in the Northeast Atlantic, where again, conservation organizations and scientists band together to inform governments throughout the region that did have a commitment for establishing a network of protected areas. And instead of establishing one, they established six in 2010. Um, and it was a complicated area because they were dealing with the extended continental shelves of some of the coastal states. 
um, and also dealing with areas of active bottom trawling in the region. But through cooperation with the regional fisheries organization, uh, they were able to secure areas closed to deep sea bottom fishing, so there's areas in red, and then put a marine protected area umbrella around it. That's to provide some additional permanence and more comprehensive management to the entire area. That's, and moving down to the deep sea, we've actually gotten concepts of representative networks of marine protected areas adopted in the context of the International Seabed Authority, who is responsible for rolling out rules and regulations for the exploration and exploitation of minerals in the deep sea beyond national jurisdiction. And this is the first time where, well, because of lack of data, they could not focus on ecologically or biologically significant areas, but used principles of connectivity, replication, adequacy in order to design a network of protected areas, areas of particular environmental interest that happened to be close to uh, seabed mining um, in 2012. They adopted principles for the management of the area as a whole, and this was a part. So it's an example of a broader spatial management plan. Of course, there's not much motion there, but there will be um, plans for seabed mining. There's many more contracts for exploration going into force. They're now developing regulations for exploitation, which they hope to have done by 2016. That's coming up fast. Uh, with respect to regional seas conventions um, and actions plans, we heard from David. You saw how there was activity in the Southern Ocean uh, here, and in, uh, I didn't tell you about the Mediterranean, but also in the Northeast Atlantic, um, with respect to marine protected areas. But there's a large part of the ocean that does not have regional seas conventions or action plans dedicated to areas beyond national jurisdiction. But many of them do have species that they care about, and species roam beyond national jurisdiction. So we're trying to work with many of these to galvanize their interest in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And we've actually um, pretty much, well, we're on the verge of succeeding on both coasts of Africa, East Africa and West Africa, as well as the um, Southeast Pacific, where the governments are now trying to work within their regional seas programs to see what can be done but also trying to work where there were no regional seas organizations. As you heard from David Freestone about the Sargasso Sea, we were able to, I guess we took the easy way out in terms of defining a permanent boundary around the Sargasso Sea, but recognizing that it is very much part of a dynamic system in the um, Western Atlantic. We've been working to raise awareness of the um, Sargasso Sea with seafarers, so this is actually a poster chart that goes onto ships as they're passing through. And what we discovered to our horror is that many seafarers spend their times below deck most of the time. And they don't even know where they are or where they're going. But the shipping companies, many of them are run by responsible seafarers who say, the ocean is our living room. We do want to know more about it. So we're trying to create uh, awareness from the shipping community. We now have an app uh, for the Sargasso Sea where you can put the high seas in the palm of your hand, a uh, little card here. Um, but also working through the relevant competent organizations like the International Maritime Organization that David was talking about. And then there's a new area uh, that I'm hoping to get some interest in here today called uh, oceanographically this Costa Rica dome. But because it straddles the exclusive economic zones of five nations, as well as being 70% in the high seas, we've renamed it pragmatically the Central American Dome. Uh, this is a very important habitat, as we said, for blue whales, but also for hammerhead sharks and sea turtles. As you can see from this earlier work by George Schillinger, who is actually, actually able to track the movement of sea turtles through the um, Southeast Pacific from the beaches of Costa Rica out into the Central Pacific gyre, and finding that they spent significant amounts of their time in the Costa Rica dome, that it was a grand feeding area as well as protecting them and swirling them quickly through. That, so uh, we're now working with Marviva Foundation in, uh, in Costa Rica, but also trying to find partners beyond who are interested in trying to develop a spatial management plan for the Costa Rica Central American Dome. Uh, that's, and as a result of what we've been doing through the Convention on Biological Diversity, in 2010, they actually launched a process to try to apply these criteria for ecologically significant areas through a series of regional workshops that bring, bring together experts in fisheries, experts in um, 
biological oceanography and experts in species that have now covered 77% of the planet. The information is not perfect, it's not total. There were many people who could not be there and hence as uh, we were hearing from Ben uh, Vassilis that your information therefore did not get represented in these workshops. But what they've been able to come up with is a pretty impressive piece of um, identification. This map I stole from the Secretariat of the CBD. It's here unofficially. We have to destroy it, or you. Um, but <laughs> that's, it will be under consideration at the upcoming subsidiary body on scientific and technical advice in uh, June of next year, because they still have more workshops planned. They're going to have one in the Arctic Ocean. Phil, I hope you'll be able to be part of this. Uh, that's for trying to pull together the best available scientific information. And of course, this is just going to existing organizations to try to see how they can um, utilize this information, but also provides wonderful core areas to see how we can protect them now and how we can protect them into the future. That's, and of course, just so you show in a more site-specific basis, we've sent scientists to the workshop that dealt with the uh, Mid-Atlantic and the Caribbean, and surprise, surprise, the Sargasso Sea stood out as an area of ecological significance. And we're also able to uh, send scientists to the workshop in the Southeast Pacific. And they also identified the Central American Dome as a very important uh, feature. And what this does is then get it recognized at the international level by the United Nations. And we're hoping that there they will then furrow it out and put more pressure on the regional sea fisheries organizations to take action. But it's still not enough. And what we need to do is to try to tie together some of these um, pieces and pictures. And thank you, John Weller, for uh, lending me these photos some while ago. They've been put to very good use in many presentations. Uh, that's, but um, working with other scientists in the room here is that we've realized that you really do have this um, alphabet soup if you will, that we've heard from Jeff Ardron yesterday. Um, I mean, I could be spewing out acronyms I do in my sleep, uh, but the idea is how do we bring this together into a coherent package? Uh, so some of us here with Natalie Ban as the lead have been working on how do you translate some of these concepts that we've used in land and coastal areas for systematically planning what goes on in the marine environment, uh, incorporating aspects of marine spatial planning, of adaptive management planning, and how do you go beyond and try to actually get these in practice. What we haven't done yet is, of course, incorporate the concepts of the changing ocean, which is a significant um, factor that will clearly need to be addressed in the very near future. Uh, that's, and let's take us back to New York, where I was just earlier this week on Monday and Tuesday. The United Nations um, held a workshop on area-based management tools for conservation and sustainable use. This is part of a larger process that's focusing on the longest title that I've seen so far, <laughs> uh, which is, I, you can read it, I'll just call it the UN Working Group on Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. Uh, where we've been grappling with, or I should say, studying issues related to conservation sustainable use for the past seven years, because it took a while to get this on the agenda. But in 2011, through a workshop IUCN co-organized with New Zealand and um, Mexico to try to bring together the EU and the G77, key representatives who had been most active on this issue, they agreed that it was time to move forward we're done with studying. It's time to identify gaps and to see what we can um, come up with. And yes, everybody agrees we need to find ways to better implement and utilize existing institutions and agreements, but it's also time to start considering updating the legal framework of the law of the sea to better adapt to changing conditions. It's developed as a package deal because the G77 was, of course, more interested in issues of building their capacity, technology, and access to marine genetic resources, um, whereas the developed countries, the uh, EU and an expanding number of states, are interested more specifically in area-based management and impact assessment. But together and as a whole, they've agreed that these are priority issues for the United Nations to consider. That's, and so at Rio, anybody go to Rio here? Okay, uh, how many people were there? A lot, Rashid. Did you count them? Okay, there were 
45,483 people who attended this uh, Earth Summit, plus 20. Um, but because of the efforts of the High Seas Alliance and others, we were able to in many ways make it an ocean summit. We didn't get everything we wanted, but we managed to get it on the map and we managed to get some important principles recognized for how we govern this vast ocean space. The High Seas Alliance, I should say, is an alliance now of 30 conservation organizations and scientists uh, who are working together to try to promote uh, enhanced protection through a new legal agreement for areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, but we got agreement with respect to, yes, it is indeed a priority that we address and um, create sort of an overarching mandate for protecting the health, productivity, resilience, and biodiversity of our ocean space. Um, as Jane was talking about yesterday, it's really this biodiversity and resilience concepts that we need to get governments to come to terms with. I mean, we're saying it now, but now we have to figure out how we actually do it. Um, but to also apply what we've been saying before, an ecosystem approach and a precautionary approach. Thus, and with respect to the high seas, as I said, we didn't quite get full agreement to launch immediately negotiations, a new high seas biodiversity agreement. But what we did get was a second best thing, which was a timetable for action. Uh, it was a step back, but it was a compromise with the United States and Russia and Venezuela, um, as well as other um, few handful of states with the entire rest of the majority who wanted to launch the new agreement now. So essentially, it's pretty much at the United Nations they are talking about how do we get to the next step of forming a negotiating committee or a preparatory committee to go forward, but what's going to be challenging us are what are the components of this new instrument. And this is where people like David Freestone, who have been working on principles for ocean governance, and people like Natalie Bann and the rest of you who are actually working in the water or above the water to better understand what is going on, and the economists like Rashid are absolutely essential in this effort to try to create a coherent whole out of what is still a very patchy and fragmented regime. That's, as David was talking about um, yesterday, we know the rules and principles that we want to govern ocean space. And the trick is trying to put these into a legally binding framework for the areas beyond national jurisdiction. And so this is just sort of my schematic of the key components of what a new instrument would contain. And of course, there are various levels of um, elaboration you can get into. Um, but just sort of looking at uh, overarching operating principles to provide a standard to measure performance so that governments and organizations can be held accountable for what they're doing and not doing. Uh, we need the effort to build capacity on marine genetic resources, sharing the benefits of our new technologies and medicines that are emerging. But we really need to focus on how do we apply and adapt area-based management tools for conservation, sustainable use. How do we be creative in designing representative networks of marine protected areas? Fortunately, we have some experience to build on. We need to foster regional cooperation. How do we build on these tiny kernels of regional seas organizations? How do we transform regional fisheries management organizations so that their focus truly is on conservation? with sustainable use as a side of that, or at least as on equal par. Um, and of course, we need financial and technical and scientific support every step of the way. Most um, international agreements now have one a conference of parties where the um, parties come together on an annual or biannual basis to report on what they've been doing, but they also have scientific advisory bodies or committees who can help to review a lot of the information coming through. We still don't have that for the high seas. Um, the global facilitation, I would mean, is something that these regional organizations are answerable to, that so people are not operating on their own in the regional levels. Well, yes, we need to do that because we can learn from what's going on, but they need to be accountable to governments as a whole, the international community as a whole, and to you and me. That's because the high seas are truly the global commons, and what happens in the remotest area of the deep Pacific truly impacts all of us, as well as future generations. That's so, of course, we're still stuck with the puzzle of how do we incorporate the dynamic aspects of marine um, ecosystems and species. And that's why I'm encouraged to be here today to explore and elaborate and to think out of the box on some of the ways that we can actually get institutions to 
adapt, to evolve, or to be redesigned so that they are much more responsive to the vast and rapid changes to the marine environment that we are expecting and the changes that we even don't know what to expect, the, known, the unknown unknowns, as Donald Rumsfeld said, said. So just um, to try to bring this to a close um, and to provide a groundwork for fertile discussion, I'm hoping, is uh, some of the next steps that I see as we go forward. And of course, we desperately need to improve and to, of course, utilize the science and technological tools we have already. But at the same time, we need to be focusing on how do we re reform and improve these existing regional fisheries management organizations that are, uh, still persist in managing for maximum sustainable yield and um, have yet to truly grapple on an even keel uh, with concepts of conservation and uh, bycatch. Uh, at the same time, we do need a general legal framework that's going to enable everybody to sing from the same, same song sheet so they're operating to the same objectives, targets, and principles. Um, and of course, we need many more regional initiatives in the water now while these legal negotiations are going forward because we truly cannot afford to wait. And I'm happy to say that I am moving back to the states uh, in July to Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I intend to fully improve my understanding of local or United States politics, but I truly hope we can also work together to try to leverage the United States' true interest in global partnership and their mantra that they always say at the United Nations is that we cooperate on issues where we cannot make progress alone. And the high seas, if anything, is the uh, ultimate example of where you cannot move ahead as any one government and we truly need international cooperation. So with that, I will say thank you to everyone, uh, to the audience, to uh, Meg and to the wonderful law students, to Stanford University for hosting it, uh, and to all of you that I've worked with or will work in the future, at least I hope so. Thank you. Questions. This one will be so easy for you. Thank you, Christina. Meg Caldwell. I am really interested in understanding accountability mechanisms. And among all the alphabet soup of different conventions and treaties and agreements that we have, what are the best accountability mechanisms that you've seen? And has there been any kind of systematic review of them? So moving forward, we know which of those we might employ for some grander scheme. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes, we are starting to look at accountability mechanisms, uh, and many treaties have evolved them in progress and as part of their process. So CITES has a decent accountability mechanism. They at least have a compliance committee. Uh, the Montreal Protocol for Ozone Depletion has, I guess, in many ways, the uh, best example of a compliance mechanism where they have been able to get parties to act. But this is something that uh, is outside the marine realm. I think we really need to look outside what has happened in the marine environment and to utilize, as you said, that nobody has done a thorough study of what the best available compliance mechanisms might be and how we try to incorporate those into any new agreement. Eric. Uh, the the identification of EPSAs was encouraging. I was hoping you could elaborate on how uh, management authorities might be using them. David, would you like to answer that question? David Freestone, Sargasso Sea Alliance. Please stand up to the microphone, yes. Well, let me start by saying that was absolutely amazing. So congratulations, that was wonderful. And thank you for, for uh, some very generous uh, uh, acknowledgments. Yeah, well, our experience with, with EPSAs is they were, we, I, I think I said that yesterday, we thought they'd be the kind of glue that, you know, you have a scientific process, an unbiased scientific process, which produces definitions, descriptions, descriptions of areas which are of scientific importance, which are agreed by 
participating governments to be of scientific importance. But we found, I didn't have time to go further than that, but we found a lot of pushback. Uh, we, I, we put the, uh, the Sargasso Sea, uh, EBSA to uh, ICAT, to NAFO. Uh, at NAFO, Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Organization, they refused to take it into account because the Norwegians pointed out that it hadn't actually been endorsed by the Conference of the Parties. This is in September of 2012. The Conference of the Parties was going to be the next month. Uh, I mean, there wasn't a process of endorsement. So they just, would, you know, they just weren't interested in listening. At ICAT, I'm afraid that uh, we know, well, let's say something about Hyderabad, but Christina was there. In Hyderabad, at the Conference of the Parties of the Biodiversity Convention, uh, Japan and China refused to agree to the endorsement of these EBSAs. And then we found systematically that the Japanese have been opposing the designation, using the EBSAs as, as, as a management tool. At ICAT, they refused to accept that this was of significance to them. Uh, and so the whole thing, whole process of looking at the Sargasso Sea again as being whether it's, a, whether it's an important uh, habitat for purposes of tuna and tuna-like species is all started again. So a lot of hope for it, but so far on, on the ground, I was going to say, I love Christina's phrase in the, on the water, not a lot of progress. And maybe this is too early days, but it's, uh, it's a principle with, it's a concept with great deal of promise, but at the moment, not a lot of Program. Yeah, well, the, part of the issue with Sargasso Sea was that it was timing, that it had not yet been approved by the Convention on Biological Diversity Conference of Parties. It was a month um, before that. But also, um, it's now subject to a political power play between the developing countries who want to put progress on conservation on a hold until we grapple with the issues of marine genetic resources beyond national jurisdiction. That so it is a package deal in many sources that has implications in other arena from the United Nations General Assembly, where they're using this as a prod to the governments who want to move forward on conservation to say, wait a minute, you can't go forward on that even in the Convention on Biological Diversity unless you deal also with the marine genetic resources. Jeff Ardrin from the Institute for the Studies of Advanced Sustainability. <laughs> like advanced remember. Studies and Sustainability. I can't even remember myself. I'm one of my co-founders of the Global Ocean Biodiversity Initiative. Yes, Jeff Arder and IASS for the microphone. Um, Christina, we have a lot of existing laws in place, and there are a lot of gaps, as you rightly pointed out. Um, a new agreement that you, that you were discussing, how would it tie these together in a way that they would actually cooperate. We already have like lots of UN GA resolutions saying thou shalt cooperate, but people are not cooperating. How would a new legal mechanism do this better than the declarations that we've seen so far? Thank you for the question. Um, always challenging as ever. Uh, that's, um, I'm seeing a number of ways. One is just simply having a conference of the parties. That's where you're bringing governments together, as they do in the CBD, as they do in the London Convention, to report on their progress. Uh, this provides a huge measure of accountability. That's um, soft power, if you will. That's a, the uh, naming and shaming. That's, but also, I was looking at the OSPAR Convention for Protection of the Marine Environment in the Northeast uh, Atlantic, and they have goals for uh, protecting marine biodiversity and ecosystems throughout the Northeast Atlantic. They have uh, the target of establishing a representative network of marine protected areas by 2012, and they also have in their agreement the duty for the Commission to develop measures in order to fulfill its objectives, which I think is what is lacking in the uh, Regional Seas Conventions and the Regional Fisheries Management Organizations, is this explicit duty to operationalize these higher level principles. Uh, and that's where you can truly hold them into account. We have indeed seen more progress. I'm looking at Martin Hall here, who's going to jump on me for saying uh, the regional fisheries management organizations have indeed improved in the last several years because we got into play a process of independent and uh, self-assessment of performance. 
That's in the fish stocks agreement. Unfortunately, there's not a continuing process of review. It meets every five years, which means there's a lot that can happen in between. But it is calling for the regional fisheries management organizations to address precaution, to address biodiversity, to address habitat needs. And so it is bringing the issues at the regional level to accountable uh, presentation at the global level is part of what we're missing now. Daniel, uh, oh, Martin, you're closest to the. This is Daniel Dunn, who uh, spent many vacation days preparing the uh, guidelines on how you actually implement the criteria. So thank you, Daniel. Yep. Uh, so um, one question. We heard a lot from Dr. Lubchenco yesterday about uh, carrots and sticks and uh, how the sticks tend to be less useful or less uh, productive sometimes than the carrots. And a lot of the discussions I've heard and Im implementation or methods to try to move forward on, uh, on ABNJ areas beyond national jurisdiction tend to be more on the stick side than on the carrot side. So I'm sort of curious if you can elaborate on how we can uh, sort of align incentives so that countries are, are incentivized to do these things as opposed to sort of using the stick. Well, in fact, international law is mainly a carrot. Uh, there's not many sticks that are available to us in international environmental law. Uh, international law progresses through capacity development, technology transfer, information, scientific advice, and occasionally, at least within national jurisdiction, you can uh, arrest vessels transgressing your um, laws and enforce them in court. Governments are very reluctant to take other governments to court, even though that is a mechanism that we have. Uh, but in terms of, and so enforcement is something that we've actually been lacking and the sticks are what we have actually been lacking on the high seas to date. That's we have these overarching commitments, but without the teeth to enforce them. Uh, fishing is supposed to be conditioned on um, ensuring the sustainable use of the fisheries resources, but there's no sanctions or there's not even, uh, there's no legal me mechanism for imposing sanctions when regional fisheries management organizations and states fail to live up to those expectations. So now it's essentially trying to close what has been the open access for so many years, unconditional open access, but to continually tighten the net, um, as others have said, to ensure that those who are willing to be responsible fishers, willing to be responsible shippers, and are able to demonstrate that they can comply with these conditions do get access to the resources. Martin. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Excellent presentation, and we'll discuss some of the issues you mentioned. Uh, one of the issues that I see being close to uses of resources and also close to people interested in conservation is that there is a, a communication hole in the middle, and it is biodiversity for fishermen is a bad word. There is no connection between biodiversity and fish production or my future. It's not. Apparently, biodiversity is preserved these odd things that some people are interested in, but they don't mean anything for us. That's a communication problem from science to fishing community. So they, they envision these reserves and these things as something to protect strange creatures, not my fishing future. And, and that makes it very easy for some people to sign on big agreements and the uses of the resource to reject them offhand. So people fishing near the Sargasso Sea don't realize that perhaps the manager of the Sargasso Sea will improve their future. That's not in their thinking. I'm just excluded from here. And that's a communication gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do appreciate that. And I would say I am in favor of incentives and um, carrots indeed in terms of conserving the oceans. but. Uh, from at least some people's point of view, access to the resources is indeed an incentive to comply with the rules that are out there. It is indeed a privilege. Please. Good morning. Uh, Jovita Deloach from the University of Paris. Um, my question is, has there been any effort to, ch to work with changing human taste? Uh, 50 years ago, salmon was not a regular uh, item on the table for most of uh, the population, and yet um, through marketing and various other uh, industry efforts, um, salmon has become a central part of uh, almost the chicken of the sea, and we have aqu aquaculture to continue to support that. Is there any effort to move to uh, um, 
more of the, the smaller, not the predator, but the smaller pelagic fish um, uh, trying to uh, alter the taste of, of, of human uh, consumption, shark fin uh, is another example. Thank you. Um, well, yes, it's Brittany here. Um, all right. Yes, okay, <laughs> we'll put you on the spot. Um, but just to say, yeah, there are tremendous efforts to um, discourage people from eating shark fin, for example, shark fin soup, what they did in Hawaii, what they've been doing in uh, Hong Kong is uh, tremendous advances. Uh, there are health advisories for people who are eating shark and tuna and orange roughy. Uh, that's because these older long-lived species tend to concentrate the mercury, so that also helps to uh, guide consumption patterns. Uh, there are lots of certification programs of uh, various levels of effectiveness. The uh, Marine Stewardship uh, Cert Council, thank you, um, is looking at sustainability of the fish stocks that they are um, putting their label on, but my understanding is that they still haven't really looked at the wider ecosystem implications of what it is that they are certifying as sustainable, so that some of these may still have tremendous levels of bycatch. Uh, so yeah, market is a tremendous force, and I know Greenpeace and WWF use it to tremendous effect, and it's something we need to keep working on. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, Sal Jorgensen from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I was wondering how uh, your thoughts on how we could deal with the issue of, of piracy, pirates, and uh, I read about these ships that sail across the ocean, they paint a flag on the back of their uh, um, ship, it's a different, uh, they change names, um, they're just not tracked. And so uh, a lot of these ships, I understand, are fishing illegally in international waters and um, don't belong to any nation per se. How do we deal with that? Thank you for the question. Uh, it is quite timely. In February, in uh, France, Interpol launched its first uh, working group on fisheries crime. That's, uh, again, uh, with the help of Pew and others, that we've been trying to highlight the significance of illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing and to make it a international concern. Because right now you have regional fisheries management organizations who some are much more effective than others in grappling with IUU fishing. So CAMLAR essentially launched a uh, certification scheme, uh, documentation scheme, where you have to notify that you're coming in with this many fish into this port, and they have a chance to, you have to prove that you caught it legally. But there are other regional seas fisheries organizations that don't have observer requirements, that don't have documentation requirements. So until you start to look at the globe, and how you can start to blacklist vessels from one region and make sure they're blacklisted in another. It's something that really needs this global communication and information exchange that Interpol and other mechanisms can provide. Vera, you're standing up. You wanted to ask a question? <laughs> I wanted to ask a quick question, Christina. Phil McGillivray from the Coast Guard. Um, I'm sort of being cattle prod a little bit to pay more attention to the International Seabed Authority. And we're getting lots of documents to review. And I wondered what your perspective on um, their development and progress for monitoring, which is, of course, always a key word for me, uh, might be. Uh, well, the International Seabed <coughs> Authority is an amazing institution. They have developed some outstanding rules with respect to explore, exploration of mineral resources to guide contractors for how they should be conducting baseline assessments, uh, environmental impact assessments. They've established, as I said, this vast system of areas of particular environmental interest. But they're now under a tremendous stress. That's uh, contracts for exploration of polymetallic nodules is uh, accelerating. We even have the United States companies who are going through the UK to get access to the uh, Pacific Ocean uh, resources. There's new interest in the cobalt crest on seamounts and that have been protected from deep sea bottom fishing via our work with the United Nations, um, but there could be contracts for exploration, exploitation of these seamounts in the same place. And of course, hydrothermal vents or the polymetallic uh, sulfides. Uh, so there's going from thir uh, eight, five to eight to 13 and 18 contracts for exploration underway. Um, the International Seabed Authority is guided by the best available science, but they're getting into an area where they don't necessarily have it. 
and how do you incorporate a system of precautionary rule setting akin to what they've done in the Clarion Clipperton zone to set aside representative areas of the marine environment from even exploration contracts, although you want to encourage scientific research, to make sure you have the capacity to develop a systematic approach to what remains after everything else has been obliterated. That's uh, in the seabed on the mining of manganese nodules, they needed the buffer zone of 100 kilometers on each side of those sites in order to uh, safeguard them from the plumes that would be created uh, during the process of seabed mining. So it's an area where we need the best scientists to go in and help to inform the development of these regulations for exploitation now. And of course, it's the same thing we had with the Mineral Management Service, an inbuilt conflict of interest. Uh, the developing countries get profits from the exploitation of mineral resources. At the same time, they're supposed to develop rules for their exploit, exploration and protection of the marine environment. So how we solve that dilemma, at least we have some experience in the United States. No pressure being the last speak question. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Lieutenant Commander Greg Cassad. I'm with the U.S. Coast Guard, and I just wanted to quickly respond to the question about IUU because this falls within the things that I work on. A couple of points about Interpol and the Fisheries Working Group and Project Scale. Interpol deals with crime. They deal with crime. Is illegal fishing a crime? Look at the look at UNCLOS. What does UNCLOS say about it? Is it a criminal act? Is it a felony? Can, so when we look at it, what Interpol can or cannot do, there's gonna be some limitations. So don't think that Interpol and the communication process it puts in place will be a panacea. It's going to take some time and effort and those communications channels on a uh, administrative issue. That's because that's what it falls down to, civil penalties. Those issues we're gonna have to take some time to work through. Um, I would also point to the Port State Measures Agreement which is a binding treaty that's in the process of going through where those blacklisted vessels will actually be prohibited from entering ports and getting port services and turned away. So some of those tools that are available, and I, I'll talk about this a little bit more this afternoon, but I just wanted to, to say there are some things out there that us enforcement types are trying to do, us practitioners are trying to do. Uh, my question to you is, you see, you talk about holding flag states accountable, coastal states accountable, and you see some of the efforts that are underway from whether it be from the EU talking about listing countries as IUU fishing countries and that having trade implications. The United States underneath uh, the MISRA process goes through Matt Magnuson Stat Stevens Reauthorization Act. As for those of us who don't deal with alphabet soup, I'm sorry, that's, that's what I deal with on a daily basis. Um, the, uh, where we have a process now, the United States, um, where we can list a nation as having engaged in IUU fishing. Do you see those type of unilateral actions in a multilateral function, you know, issue, are those valuable? Are they actually going to, do you think they'll actually have some benefit of holding those flag states accountable and actually perhaps moving that, that ball forward uh, and making people more responsive? Well, thank you, that's an excellent question, and it gives me a chance to plug some of this literature here, because I always forget it's around. Um, but I was down, actually, at the Pew Fellows meeting in Panama in December, and um, meeting with somebody who's running this uh, Central American Dome project. They're also running a um, surveillance and enforcement project for the Cocos uh, Mapello uh, Archipelago. And um, at this meeting was the Minister for Fisheries from Panama, and it was just at the same time that the EU had uh, blacklisted them. And the Minister of Panama was like so grateful for this project going on in the region that was going to improve capacity for enforcement, monitoring, and surveillance because they took it seriously and they were going to do what they could to get off that blacklist. So yes, those sorts of sanctions uh, do make tremendous difference and uh, the unilateral action of states is often indeed the way international law progresses. That, so sometimes you do have to stretch it to the limits of what you can do and to be bold and go out and do the best thing you possibly can within the constraints of what's happening to your neighbors. So thank you. One more question. <laughs> Barry Gold, Moore Foundation. Um, since, you, since you asked me uh, when I was up Please. what I was thinking about, it was, um, you know, you've presented as a complicated legal framework and policy structure. We've heard about the complicated science that it takes to think about the oceans. Um, 
we know that there's a huge amount of wealth that's accruing to individuals, to organizations, and to some cases, countries. What we have is a lot of unfunded needs in order to be able to move forward and manage. Are there any thoughts at the international scale to thinking about how we create um, a funding mechanism to support the management of the oceans? Here in the U.S., we're trying to create the national endowment for the oceans. But it strikes me that much of what we struggle with is we don't really have the resources to implement the management that we're trying to do. Very good question. Um, I think part of the idea behind the marine genetic resources debate is trying to help uh, su support the development of a fund that would build capacity of developing countries, um, support international conservation initiatives. But um, because marine genetic resources is not going to be a huge source of finance, of funds, for the time being, uh, we still really are grappling with the issue of how do you finance ambitions of this scope and scale. The Global Environment Facility has a number of projects now in areas beyond national jurisdiction. They are focusing primarily on fishing activities, on tuna and deep sea bottom fishing. Um, but they could, if channeled in appropriate ways, really help to build the capacity of developing countries, build the capacity of development, de developed countries to better utilize the resources we have out there and to um, help manage and uh, support the establishment of marine protected areas. The International Seabed Authority does have an endowment fund already that governments are encouraged to provide funding to. But I think as long as you've seen it's, it's encouragement as opposed to an automatic, uh, I think you need the opt-out mechanism as opposed to the opt-in mechanism we've been hearing about, um, it's going to be very hard going. But I think that's a very useful thing to start thinking about in the future. So thank you. <laughs>